It's been two weeks, almost to the hour, since a double murder devastated one of the most powerful, most prominent, and most private families in South Carolina. Tonight, movement in the Murdoch case on multiple fronts and a new look at more than one violent death from the past. And then later, one of the most creative, one of the funniest actors on the screen. He won two Emmys for Veep and he stole every scene in Arrested Development. From character voices on Toy Story to that guy jamming to Mr. Roboto, the remarkable Tony Hale, tonight on Banfield. Hello and welcome to Banfield, the South Carolina police agency that one week ago promised transparency in its search for the killer or killers of Paul and Maggie Murdoch, has now issued a new statement from the chief himself. Here's what it reads. I urge the public to be patient and let the investigation take its course, he writes. This case is complex and we will not rush this or any investigation. Investigative decisions we make throughout this case must withstand the scrutiny of the criminal justice process. SLED agents continue to interview possible witnesses, collect and process potential evidence, and investigate every lead with the same diligence we devote to every case." End quote. Those interviews, leads, and bits of evidence remain undisclosed. But tonight, we know of several developments that police are not yet ready to talk about. We know investigators have carried out a search warrant at Paul Murdoch's college apartment and that they have spent some time in a river some two and a half miles from the Murdoch family hunting lodge where Paul and his mother Maggie were found shot to death two weeks ago tonight. It's now come out to reporters that members of the boating party that ended with the death of Mallory Beach in 2019 have all given DNA samples to aid in the Murdoch case, as has Alec Murdoch, Paul's father and Maggie's husband. Paul, at 22, was facing trial in that case when he himself was killed. Paul's uncles have revealed that young Paul had received threats before his own death. And the mother of a young man who was brutally killed way back in 2015, six years ago, says that police have now contacted her about the Murdoch murders and possible motive. I'm joined tonight by a pair of intrepid reporters. Michael Schur is national correspondent for News Nation, and Andrew Davis is his investigative reporter for WSAV-TV in Savannah. Andrew, let me begin with you. There have been a lot of developments that have come out today, not the least of which is this, this statement and then this very redacted, and I'm just going to show what it looks like, like how redacted this report is. And when I show each of these pages, it's almost like it's not worth showing it at all. That's just a, a short sort of precis of the statement, but they are really not releasing anything other than we responded to the double murder scene, collected some shell casings and set up a perimeter. Why is it so redacted? Well, that's the question I think a lot of people have, whether you're in Hampton, whether you're here in any part of Beaufort County and beyond, is why are we getting no information whatsoever? The question that we have started with was he initially came out and said, there's no worry about a suspect. There's no danger to the community. Yet at the same point, we don't have a suspect right now. And then they turned around later and said, well, now we actually may have misspoken when we said that. Then they offered the tip line later on after saying there was sort of no need for the public to get involved. Uh, the entire town of Hampton is incredibly quiet. That entire area of Colton County and Hampton County where the Murdaws are involved in are incredibly quiet because they have so much power so much influence there and many people feel that they've almost had too much over this time and have used it to their advantage and to disadvantage of many other people so there are a lot of people who won't speak about this who aren't going to speak for fear of some sort of retaliation out there whatever that may be even though we don't know of anything of the sort he was a uh, involved with law enforcement randolph the the elder randolph there along with alex and uh, everybody else in that family you know paul was sort of the 
the bad seed as it was, which people knew somewhere. And he's the one who <clears throat> ended up in trouble with this family. And that's really the question that many people have is, why Paul, why the mother? And the rumor mill is just spinning right now, Ashley. And that's really the, the problem that we're confronted with is there are so many theories, there's so many little pieces of information that are coming out and no one knows truly what the answer is about what happened. And that's what's baffling a lot of people in town. They want some sort of information and a release that comes out looking like this is not gonna help anybody out there. When we got it earlier today, I said, great, we're gonna get new information until you look at it and realize all it offers is there were officers that came to the scene found two bodies on the ground, which were Paul and Maggie, and then they put up a tent and started asking, does anybody have any video cameras? Because my understanding so far from people in the know is that there were no video cameras on that property or very few that may point to anything in that hunting lodge to try to give people any sense of what happened. Well, that is very distressing, Andrew, to hear that, because we had certainly hoped that in their investigation, at least other residences even might have some, you know, ring.com uh, cameras that could have seen vehicles coming and going at that time of the night. Michael Shore, let me turn my attention to you for a moment. This was particularly interesting to me. Once Paul was killed, murdered, um, clearly the, the, the civil suit regarding the boating incident that he was alleged to have caused as, as a, a BUI, a boating under the influence, uh, those charges would fall away, but the civil suit was continuing. But now we're learning from some of the local reporting there that a state grand jury is being convened and that it's actually gonna examine whether there was some obstruction of justice on the part of Paul's dad, Alec Murdoch, and Paul's grandfather. Do you know anything about that? And I understand asking you that, that's a hard question because no one behind you in that building is talking. No, no one in this building behind me actually is talking, but it, it's it's a question that's being asked because they did speak to people in this building behind me. And just to point out, this is where the Colleton County Sheriff's Department is in the law enforcement center here in Walterboro, South Carolina, which is about an hour from Hampton uh, and about 25 miles from where Islandton is, which is where the murders happen. One thing to keep in mind is that the, this Sheriff's Department on two occasions recused themselves from an investigation. It paints a picture of of just how influential the Murdoch family was and is in this part of the country. So they had to recuse themselves because too many of them had had interactions professionally and familiarly with the, the Murdoch family. So that's what, uh, what leads people to think that, okay, there may have been obstruction of justice because there was such a closeness between this, you know, this very entrenched family here in, in, in this part of South Carolina and the law enforcement here. They've been prosecutors here literally since 1920. They've been solicitors in this county and four other counties in South Carolina. So all of this goes to paint the picture that, yes, there may have been obstruction of justice in that case. One thing to point out, though, Ashley, is that Paul, the late now uh, Paul Murdoch, uh, who was implicated in that and who did have those three uh, BUI counts against him and was going to face some sort of a trial and imprisonment, it was likely, uh, Paul Murdoch was not a uh, part of that civil suit. The family of the deceased in that boating accident from 2019 was going after the family of the Murdoch family, the fathers, uh, the father and, and maybe even the mother for allowing their son to become intoxicated as well as uh, the place where they bought that liquor that night in 2019 that allowed that to happen. It's a chain here in the low country of South Carolina called Parker's. It's owned by a big multinational company, uh, but that's who they were going after. So Paul not being a part of it does mean that the case can still go forward, Ashley. Okay, so Andrew, jump back in here. Uh, a couple of pieces of business that I just want to check through because, like you said, the rumor mill is big, but there's also the reporting mill. And there's some reports that have come out today that I think are fascinating. So to start with, this, uh, this potential grand jury that is going to examine whether there was obstruction of justice, apparently this, according to uh, a source called The State, pertains to Paul's dad and Paul's granddad uh, coming to the scene of the boating accident and stopping all interviews and preventing sobriety tests. Now that could be innocuous. I know it doesn't sound like it, but to, to legal journalists and reporters out there who know the law, that is not unusual. If your lawyer gets to the scene and they're lawyers, you would immediately say, don't speak until you have a lawyer and don't submit to a, a breathalyzer until we know, you know, probable cause. That, that wouldn't be unusual, but there is this investigation. And then there's this reporting that comes from Good Morning America as well, that Alec Murdoch, that's Paul's dad, 
as well as Mallory Beach's entire family, as well as all of the other occupants of that boat, four other occupants, right, teenagers who were in the boat, have all submitted DNA samples to help in this double murder investigation. To me, that, listen, you don't have to have spidey senses on this one. To me, this says, Andrew, that the police are going to every potential motive point, every person who might have had a beef with the Murdoch family, and they're trying to cancel them out of motive. Does that, is there any other reporting or information that would clear these people, or are they all still under the umbrella? Uh, I think they're all under the umbrella because I don't think they really have a great sense on who the suspect may be. That's why you include that Beach family, who many people would believe have that beef in there, as you talked about, to do it. But everything that I've known about the Beach family is, while they are incredibly upset, devastated by what happened to Mallory, they have had a year and a half to deal with it, and they have handled it very calmly. Obviously, the civil suit is one of the focuses, but they wanted to see Paul go to justice. And I, you know, I, whether they could be responsible for this, I would personally be surprised from only talking to them briefly that I have. You know, the other question that you talked about, the Murdoch family being at the scene, how did they get to the scene so quickly considering the situation was still going on? I talked to a maritime expert today who stayed anonymous with me, but in fact, we were speaking of it, and he said, I wonder if that crash didn't happen a little earlier than what we thought. Did he call his dad before the police were called, before the DNR were called? In. And that's still a question that some people have out there, that he could get there faster than so many of the law enforcement officials that happened. And how exactly did that happen? So that's where some of those people want that investigation to continue out from everything that's gone on. The solicitor's office here locally, who does cover five, uh, five different counties, as you spoke earlier, the, the predecessor to, or excuse me, the, uh, the, the after the gentleman, Duffy Stone, who's now currently the uh, the solicitor here has said he's right now not going to recuse himself, even though Alec has worked for his office before, mostly as his statement he just released a few minutes ago saying, to my knowledge, there's no clear suspect in this case at this time. As such, speculation about the propriety of my office's involvement is precisely that speculation. But as we talked about, there's a lot of speculation. The woman that you're speaking of from Hampton County that happened years ago, Paul Murdoch has never been directly connected to her in this case as far as investigators are sold. But it's very interesting that they would come to her to try to get a DNA sample, to try to get some information, because does that mean they are connecting it back to Paul somewhere later on? Because that has been a huge rumor in this community that Paul was involved okay, in that. So let me be clear. Yeah, let me be clear on, on the, per I think who you're talking about right now is Sandy Smith. I think we have a picture of yeah. Sandy Smith holding up a picture of her son, Stephen Smith. And let me just be really clear to our viewers, there's reporting that Sandy Smith uh, was called by the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. There's Sandy Smith and there is her son. Uh, in 2015, her son was killed in what was considered a hit and run, um, a criminal homicide investigation, according to Sandy Smith, who told reporters was never opened. She's very upset about that. But she recently, recently got a call from the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division asking about the Murdoch's. And the reason there's any connection at all is because there is also reporting that there were tips that came in after the hit and run of her son that pointed towards Paul Murdoch and his brother Buster. So we can't confirm or deny that. Uh, we have tried to reach out to Sandy Smith. We cannot get her to confirm that. There is reporting that suggests the reason she received this phone call from SLED definitely says that SLED is worried about a motive of everybody with a connection. So they have made the connection, if there is any connection at all. And she, for her part, Sandy Smith said this was a slap in the face, that she's getting a call about motive um, regarding well, yeah, uh, the murder of, of Sandy. Put, yeah, Sandy's never directly pointed at Paul at any point in time in any interview she's ever done. That's why it's surprising to see her even get connected in any form, whether it's in this reporting and according to what's going on there. You know, But that's the question that so many people in this community have. Paul Murdoch was never brought to jail at any point in time to be booked for these charges. His mugshot was taken in the hallway of the courthouse after his hearing, and he was in a polo shirt. He never had to be booked. He never had to be fingerprinted. And it made a lot of people angry beyond the Beach family to see this family who has so much influence get away with something else and not have this young boy, guilty or not, at least have to face the same questions and the same situations right. that anybody else in the same situation would be in.
Okay, so Michael Schur, just quickly, two more points that I want to uh, cover in, in the, the most recent developments, and that is that last week, sled agents were seen out with divers at the, um, and, and pardon my pronunciation, the Salkahatchee River, about two and a half miles south of the property where the two bodies were found. But then, more recently, apparently sled agents got a warrant to go through Paul's apartment where he was going to college. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, and that's in Columbia, South Carolina, the capital of the state. And they uh, allegedly saw a door open in his room and were able to get a warrant to go into that room. You know, again, there, what we're hearing is very cryptic. We're hearing little bits and pieces, as you often do in cases like this, but because there are so many people involved and you're going back to cases in 2019, cases where this family wasn't even implicated, like the Stephen Smith case, there's so many you know, parts to this case, putting them all together. If it's a big deal for us, imagine what it's like for SLED to do that. That said, uh, that, that we can follow a few of the crumbs here. If we're following the crumbs to that river, it could be that they're, they're looking for weapons that may have been there. It's alleged that these people, though it hasn't been confirmed, were shot with two different kinds of weapons. The mother and the son uh, were, were shot, one with a, with a rifle, a, a high power rifle, and, and the other was an assault weapon. We haven't had confirmation of that. When you go through these redacted statements today, you see not very many contradictions, but you do see uh, some uh, places where they're talking about the residences, but you don't see whether or not there was a forced entry into the residence. Uh, Moselle, which was their hunting lodge in the sort of straddles Colleton and Hampton counties here. And then when when you look further into those, you also see that sometimes that, that address is, is put forward and then there is another address that they don't show. They do say that they're looking for videotape, uh, like you were saying, Ashley, ring perhaps, uh, any kind of surveillance from neighbors. But again, neighbors are few and far between out in this unincorporated part of Colleton County. So seeing that might just show you a car flying by. It might show you something else, but they're not saying at all what they're finding. The only solid, uh, you know, sort of report that we have is that they were in Columbia and they were at that river, the river that we're not going to try and pronounce again, saying that they are um, that they are looking into those and we can only surmise what could be going on there. All right, Michael Schur and Andrew Davis, thank you so much for your reporting. We're going to stay on this story because these developments continue to hit the news on an hourly basis. And just ahead, my experts, former FBI profiler and current star of two investigation discovery series, Candace DeLong is going to join me, as well as forensic scientist Larry Koblinski. Their read on this latest information is next. Welcome back. Uh, we are breaking down what we know of the Murdoch murders with two preeminent voices. Larry Koblinski rules the forensic science arm of the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And Candace DeLong is a former FBI profiler and host of Deadly Women and Facing Evil, both on Investigation Discovery. Welcome to you both. Candace, I'm going to begin with you. I showed this the last block. This is the latest statement from SLED, the, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. And page after page, pitch black. Literally, what was the point of even releasing it? There are a couple of lines that are helpful. We already knew what was in them. Shell casings were found, two bodies, crime scene, uh, you know, tape surrounding. Why would they be so hush about this particular case? Because they, they have something. They know something. They're on the trail. Uh, it sounds like they're on a good trail that they believe is going to lead them to the solution of this crime. And it would be not helpful at all for the public to know that. So, Larry, um, <laughs> we already talked about casings. That's a no-brainer. The casings will be a huge part of the evidence. But whatever else they have, they're not saying. I did see one little piece they didn't redact, and that was that a tow truck was called and towed a blank to the, the lockup, right? And they're gonna process that, um, but nothing much more than that. It's at the impound, and I'm assuming they're gonna look for anything they can in the vehicle that was left, but no killer is gonna leave his or her vehicle there. Well, you know, vehicles get impounded and the uh, crime scene people go through it with a fine tooth comb. Uh, they'll collect DNA and uh, trace evidence and determine who is driving the vehicle. If the vehicle is linked somehow to this uh, double homicide, they'll have DNA evidence uh, from that vehicle.
So, Candace, uh, the uh, sled officers who were at the um, the young man's apartment, the victim, Paul Murdoch, uh, his apartment where he went to college, uh, you know, there is reporting that they took a computer out of there. That would not be surprising. You would want to know who he was you know, contacting um, at, at the last time he was using the computer. What else would they look for in his apartment? Hmm. Well, all kinds of, I would imagine they're looking for evidence of other kind of people that were in there. If, if they find evidence, uh, DNA, hair, fingerprints of people that were in his room that matches any kind of uh, evidence that they found at the crime scene or in the car that you mm. just re recently mentioned, that would be very illuminating. Candace DeLong and Larry Kublinski, thank you so much. We're going to continue following this story um, because, like I said, developments are regular. And when we come back after the break, one of the hardest working comedy actors today, his name is Tony Hale. Uh, is there a chance the show Veep could come back? I'm going to ask him about that next. <laughs> he is one of the funniest and most in-demand actors in Hollywood, and he launched into the stratosphere as Gary, the overachieving aide to the president on Veep. But he was also Buster, the pathetically adorable brother on Arrested Development. And if you didn't know this, he was the voice of Forky in Toy Story 4. But his new show, The Mysterious Benedict Society, is coming out on Friday, and it has him playing two hilarious characters. Welcome, Tony Hale. I, I am so excited to talk to you, Tony, because I I'm sure you've heard this a lot, but I am a crazy fan of Veep, and oh. in no small part because of you. <laughs> That's so nice. Your lighting is so much better than mine. I apologize. For it. <laughs> it's oh it's still, we've got the pandemic hangover. Everyone's still on Zoom, and I have a village. <laughs> okay, I look like I'm in the shadows, but all right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so first things first. Uh, yesterday was was Father's Day. You have a teenage daughter. I was dying to know if she finds you as funny. Um, on Veep or any of the other roles you've done, Arrested Development, as the rest of us do? No, right when you started, I had an immediate answer. No. No, I'm aware <laughs> that she's, she's, she's my precious. I love her. She's 15, but I'm, she's embarrassed by every single thing I do, which um, well, only adds, you know, fuel to the fire, which makes me want to embarrass her more. Um, but amen. she's the best. I have that I have that affliction here in this household with a 14 year old and 15 year old two sons who think I'm ridiculous. Even if I say hello to someone in an elevator, I'm embarrassing. Do you have that too? I mean as a, as a public person, how do you uh, how do you like equate what's going on in their heads? I don't know. I mean, she it's funny cuz I don't she doesn't really um I mean, she never really got into, she was too young when Arrested Development was happening. She was, she wasn't, Veep wasn't very appropriate. So she hasn't really gotten into much of what I, much of what I do. Um, but the other day in the car, <laughs> she's, I was singing and she says, Dad, do you think I have a good, do you think you have a good voice? And I said, eh, not really. And she goes, well, at least you're aware of it. <laughs> I was like, good timing. Well, so it's a good, that's a good point that you bring up that, you know, she was too young for arrested, even though it's, you know, people are watching it now in droves. It has mass, mass fan appeal. But your wife, Martel, who was a makeup mm -hmm. artist, worked on SNL, is acclaimed yeah. for her work. She, I watched you tell, I think, Jimmy Fallon or Jimmy Kimmel or somebody that she wasn't a fan of your work either. She, <laughs> oh, I think that was, I think that was Fallon. I think we were playing, um, oh, you know that game Celebrity? We were playing mm -hmm. where you kind of pick up names. and you're, It's like a, a, a charades kind of a game. And we were on a team. And I, I think my clue was Alvin and the Chipmunks. And I was in that movie. And I was telling her, you know, I was in this movie. I was being chased by rodents. And all she said was, you know, Ratatouille. And I was like, well, <laughs> I wasn't in that movie. <laughs> so do you follow what I do? Like she, she and, then, oh, and then I said, then I said, well, then I said, well, honey, I was, I wasn't in that movie. And she goes, well, you can't expect me to see everything you've done. <laughs> like, right. Yeah, you can. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Those are big projects, right? <laughs> like we're married. You should see my movies. 
<laughs> so does it bring you down a notch? I mean, obviously you're out in public oh, yeah. and on the red carpet, everyone's Tony, Tony, look over here, click, 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 and then you get home and they're like, I'm sorry, and you are? Well, it's, it's not just that. The characters I play, they're not the most um, courageous human beings. <laughs> so it's like my, <laughs> the characters I play are pretty, uh, they're, they're, they're just constantly brought down a notch. So that's, even when I'm in character, that happens. But it's like, even right now, I'm, I'm, we're in, um, I'm in North Carolina with my family, my extended family. Uh, with our, at our friend um, Dave and Alan's house, they were kind of invite us, and it's it's just like it, it's very family. Like it's just kind of it's not really an issue, which is which is nice when you're kind of out of that kind of LA scene a little bit. Well, are you are you more recognized for Gary uh, from Veep? And there you are with the cast. I think that might be the Golden Globes oh. or some other fancy event where you guys just walked away with I so much to... hardware. Or or are you more recognized for Buster Bluth on Arrested Development or or any other projects? I would say probably, I mean, Arrested, definitely people really enjoyed uh, Buster. And the, but then it kind of got half and half with Veep, especially when kind of with politics as, you know, nutty as it was these past few years, people were watching a lot of Veep and, you know, it was kind of something, you know, you, it was hard to laugh at the news. So they were kind of, easy, it was easier to laugh at Veep. So a lot more people started watching that. But then like when Toy Story happened, um, it was it's always sweet because if kids love Forky, um, they'll come up to me and their parents will be like, hey, he played Forky. And the kid's like, nah, that's not Forky. So it's really fun. I'll send their parents a voice memo from Forky so that they can play to them. And so the kids uh -huh. just that, that kind of that kind of blows their minds. So that's always fun. Well, there's something about you that resonates with tattoo parlors and your fans because there we discovered, I don't know if you know about this, but it is mad crazy. Uh, we discovered all of these fans who have tattoos of you and a lot of them are of Buster with your hook, you know, the hook hand. They, oh. It's like, oh. it, right? Look wow. at this. It's right. Did you know oh, about this? Wow. No. Wow. Whoa. Wow. No, I have not seen those. Wow. Yeah, so, Come on. Oh, that arm. And they, they're, they're this. Okay. So for those who might not know, a seal, like in, in the, in the show, Arrested yeah, Development, yeah. a seal bit off, bit off Buster's hand, and it ended up being yeah. a, a hook. And there's your famous expression, "Hey, brother." Hey, brother. Hey, brother. I know. A, what was fun is when I was shooting the show. I remember going up to Mitch Hurwitz, the creator, and saying, oh, you, you know, I had like a, a crazy idea for Buster. And he goes, no, I think I'm going to have a seal bite off your hand. And I was like, well, <laughs> that's funnier. That's better. But yeah, people love, and then this, that, that new season, I got all these different uh, extensions on my hand. So they put a hook, and then they put like a hospital hand, and then they put one of those like um, months, like mechanical hands. They put all different kind of things. Oh yeah, there's another hand. They just added all these extensions on me. And I was like, actually, it's, I had no crazy. idea kind of what was going on in the story. And the props department would just put a different hand on me. And I'd be like, so what, is, what does this have to do with anything? And they go, I don't know, just do it, man. <laughs> None of us really just, know. Just go with it. it, just go with just it. Go well, with just it. before I go to break, I wanna show, it wasn't the only tattoo that, um, your fans loved a, a, a bunch of people got t uh, tattoos of a Forky, of your character oh. Forky. Like, what is it about you, a voiceover character, and you've got fans getting tattoos of Forky because of you? Oh, oh I don't think it has anything to do with me. That has everything to do with those Pixar amazing people. And support Forky was so sweet because he just came into the world and he was like, "Listen, guys, I'm just here to help people eat chili and go to the trash. That's all I'm made for." <laughs> and and Woody comes along. He's like, "No, you're you're made to be a toy. You're made to love and be loved." And he's like, "All right, I'll go. Okay, I just thought I was going to the trash." But look at him. Well, he's it's so, so fabulous. I mean, what a what a tribute to know that people are are doing the indelible uh, image of you and your character on their body parts. Uh, when we uh, we're gonna go to break, but when we come back, Tony, I I am dying to hear about what it was like um, on the set when you weren't recording. And also, when you were recording, how often you would just break down in laughter with people like Julia Louis-Dreyfus and the rest of the cast of Veep. So we're coming back with the marvelously talented Tony Hale after this.
with the uh, talented Tony Hale, who just makes me laugh when I hear his name. Tony, I, I really mean it when I say that. I hear your name and I instantly think of Gary. I do love Buster Bluth, without question from Arrested Development, but I wondered what it was like just working on the show Veep with those comedians and how much you guys just laughed your entire day at work. Um, we really did laugh the entire time to the point where I remember I, w I broke during a scene and Julia turned to me and she said, Tony, you know, you're, you, you know, you're not watching the show. You're in the show. And I just, cause I couldn't keep it together. And it's like, when you're working with those kind of people, it's impossible to just keep it together. And it was constantly challenging and also the writing and they gave us, and but the thing is I was, I wasn't, Selena's character never let me speak. <laughs> So I would just stand behind her and just make facial expressions. And I'm the one who had to constantly keep it together. And I was really, oh, and actually, if you look, if I, I have a, I carry around this bag all the time. And when you see me looking in my bag, I'm just laughing. That's not, that's not me looking in my bag. That's oh. me just trying to cover a laugh. No kidding. Was there anything actually in the bag? Like I, were, I remember thinking if there were like some items just in case you guys were going to ad lib something like what was in the bag? Um, I think if Gary actually saw what was in my bag, he would be ashamed. I think it was like, you know, empty water bottles and like script pages. But in Gary's <laughs> bag, he, yeah, you know, he probably sewed hundreds of pockets in there because he had a, a pocket for each separate thing that she need. He, he had Costco versions of that bag stuff in his apartment just in case he runs out because God forbid he runs out. You know, he, his identity was completely Selena. So whatever, if he ever did not have what she needed, he would just completely have a mental breakdown. And for sure, there were like several uh, versions of chapstick. I just, I always assumed oh. that it would be chapstick immediately at the ready in Gary's bag. Hundreds of brands. So was, I remember reading that um, it wasn't uh, a big ad lib show, even though when you watch it, it just looks like it's entirely ad lib. There had to be some, you know, extemporaneous stuff in there. Yeah. Well, what, what they did is uh, Armando Iannucci for the first four years was the showrunner, and then it was David Mandel. And they really allowed us to have a lot of rehearsal time. And so they would give us a script and then we would find ways to kind of come up with bits or to see if stuff gelled, um, pitch jokes. But once we were on set, it was pretty set in stone. However, I will say what was, I think what was probably my favorite um, part of doing the show was we had the script, we had, you know, we had the kind of choreography. But then we kind of got on set and kind of what we could do with the physicality. Like Julia, for instance, I would be putting on her coat and I would miss an arm. Or she would drop her purse and I would try to catch it. All these different ways that we would try to find different physicality to make it funnier. And just for her to kind of constantly <laughs> abuse me was just like, there was nothing funner than that. Because Gary, my character, he just had rose-colored glasses on. I mean, she was Jesus to him. She could not do any wrong. So he never heard her abuse. He just bounced back. But just any ways we could get her to kind of put a jab at him was just, that was a joy to do. I mean, it kills me that I read somewhere that your parents once said that Arrested Development was a stupid show. <laughs> yeah. And that then that Veep is too mean. And then, they, yeah. I mean, they had to have come around, especially that moment on the Emmys when you walked up on stage with Julia. Oh, yeah. She's getting her award. And you played Gary on stage behind yeah. her. Yeah. You know, obviously yeah. in television, you just can't run the Emmys anytime you want. So I think we have a picture of yeah. you standing there and you were holding her purse. How did that happen? Did you come up with that idea? Did she? When did you decide to do this? Yeah, so we, <laughs> oh, memories. I love Julia. Um, we, she called me uh, that morning of the Emmys and said, I think I have an idea. I think I'm going to want you to carry my purse on stage. And in my head, I was like, okay, A, I think you are going to win. And B, that sounds crazy. But I just said, all right, let's go for it. And then we kind of came up with a little bit, but then just I forgot about it. And then when she won, it was like, all right, game on. <laughs> I'm going to go with your purse, see what happens. And thankfully, I think it oh, worked out. Hopefully, It worked so well. I watched it live and I was dying. So, of course, you know, everybody else like me who's a, a Veep fan, we just want another reunion. I know you did some table reads. Mm. You raised money for, you know, different political causes. Um, but wh what about it? What about a full movie? What about doing more? Oh like, just gosh. more content. That would be, I know that every single person on the show would be on board because we love that show so much. I think it's, it's up to kind of HBO and David Mandel and 
Armando and all, all those wonderful, talented people if they want to do it. But I know that the minute they say it, we all are just in there. Because we not only do we love the material, but we just love each other. And we have such a good time behind the scenes and working together. And I don't know, it was, it was really special. It was a real special uh, place. So you can't make any news with me right now. It's not as though there's any little conversations yeah. going on no, that I might wish, actually end up. By the way, that would be my joy. It would be my joy if I could make news. If somebody said we are doing it, I'd just start crying because I miss those people so much. That would be such a blast. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm starting a, a you know a petition for it because I, I think you know we, we've all been starving for content during pandemic and we've watched everything oh. that's available. So that would be delicious. Okay. I just wanted to ask you a little bit about this this commercial that I was unaware. My team was unaware that you were you started your acting career. You had this commercial, and mm. now looking back on it, it's like of course that's Tony Hale. I want to play the ad. It's a Volkswagen ad that features you acting crazy inside the Volkswagen and then we get it. We 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 realize real quick why. Let's take a look at it. I'm going to ask you about it on the other side. Speaker stereo, just one of over 40 features now standard on the new Golf. Wow. Eight speaker stereo system. That should give you how anachronistic that is. Like that was a long time ago, bro. Exactly. And boy, how fun. Do you, have you seen that in a while? It's been, I, I, I shot that show, I think 21 years ago. And no, not that show, that commercial 21 years ago. And, uh, I just, I mean, I, I remember them kind of giving me the idea and being like, aren't you going to go crazy in a car to the song? Um, I was excited because I hadn't been out to L.A. before to shoot, and so they brought me out to L.A. I think I was really excited just the fact that they gave me free lunch. Um, Dude, I think it has to be longer than 21 years ago. It's a cassette system they're advertising, and 21 years ago, I think we were already into CDs. That might be true. That might be, oh, Oh, wow, man. Time flies, Ashley. What's happening? Sorry What's to happening? age you, fella. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If I brought my stuff up from the 80s, we'd all get a good laugh. Okay, when we come back after the break, Tony, I've got all these questions for you from our social media followers, and they're really good. Like, these people know you, but I also have a little game I want to play, and it's called Doctor or Not Doctor. We're going to test your memory of the roles that you played to see okay. if you were a doctor or not a doctor. We are You're going to bring shame on me? With we are not bringing shame. I think you're going to know every one of them. Tim Matheson right, we'll nailed this one. I expect you're going to as well. Back in a moment. enough of Tony Hale, then you're in luck. This Friday, uh, his new project starts streaming on Disney+. Plus. It's called The Mysterious Benedict Society. You, this is a popular book series. For those who don't know, it's about four orphans with special skills who are recruited to save the world, and you play twin brothers. I, you know, I've always mm -hmm. wanted to know what it was like playing twins. Do you do them at the same time and go back and forth, or do you do only one role, and then you go back mm -hmm. and you shoot the other role? What's it like? Yeah, we would do we would do kind of one. We would go back and forth because um, we we shot an eight episode uh, series, and so I kind of had to go back and forth. But it was very fun playing two completely different personalities. And you're right, this is a really best. This is a really popular book series, and I'm incredibly honored to be a part of it. It's I don't know if, if um, you've read it or, or heard of it, but it kind of it starts off in something called the emergency is happening which is this state that's kind of bringing everybody into panic and fear, and no one can kind of put their finger on what's causing it. And so I gather these four kids together to help to help find the source. But the thing that I'm really crazy about is these kids, they don't have magical powers. Their superpower is their intellect, their creativity, and their empathy. And that's what kind of finds the source, and it's a really beautiful, fun story. Really beautiful. I love it. It has like a lemony snicket feel to it. Okay, I'm going to yeah. do the rapid fire thing that we did All with right. Tim Matheson, who I know you know from Animal House. He played Otter. He was great at this game. So because you've had so okay. many roles in your acting career, we're going to do this. We're going to. It's good. Doctor or not doctor is the name of the game. I'm going to name okay. the um, the show, and then you have to tell me if you played a doctor or. We're not 
a doctor. First okay, is great. an easy one. We'll start easy. Great. Veep. Not a doctor. You're right. It was Gary Walsh. Although you studied science at the University of Virginia, oh, that's very your bachelor's degree, <laughs> your bachelor's can degree there, can there be like, for Gary. Is there like a <laughs> wannabe a doctor? Maybe I'll do like a wannabe a doctor. <laughs> I think he wanted to be, but his bachelor's degree ended up being hotel management, which I, I love. Okay, Doc McStuffins. Doctor or not doctor when you played uh, in the show Doc McStuffins? Oh, my gosh. You are really digging. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to say not a doctor. You're right. You played Tobias the Elf in okay. two of the show's right. Christmas episodes. Spoiler, <laughs> uh, they save Christmas both times, so good on you. That's excellent. Another yeah. another yeah. Disney uh, checkmark. So the next one Great. is Samantha Who, doctor or no doctor? I think I was a doctor. I think I was a psychiatrist, wasn't I? Wasn't I a therapist? Yes, so great. You played Dr. Andy yeah. Adams, and you were helping the main character get her memory back. The main character was Samantha, obviously, played mm -hmm. by Christina Applegate. And bonus round here, you also played a doctor on Christina Applegate's show uh, called Up All Night. So look at you, getting a twofer out of Christina oh. Applegate's products. <laughs> and that's, and okay, that, scene ready for the next with, one. Um, that scene was with Jean Smart right there. I'm crazy about it. I love Jean Smart also. Christina. Isn't anyway. she amazing? I love her. Um, I love Jean Smart. Okay. <laughs> This is going back, Tony, Dawson's Creek. Doctor or not doctor? Uh, doctor. Yeah. You played yeah. a doctor that asks Dawson if he wants to take yeah. his elderly friend off of life support. Look at you with the smarty pants glasses. Okay, Sex in the oh City. Did you play a doctor or not a doctor on Sex in the City? No, I was a photographer's assistant, Tiger. <gasps> you nailed it. That was a long time ago. That was like 20 years ago. You. Who's a tiger? Look at you. I remember that. Thank you. Yes, Thank and you. apparently there's the shot of you freaking out because the photographer was doing a, a nude photo session with um, Kim Cattrall, obviously Samantha, the character played by Kim uh, Cattrall. Yeah. And she had to get nude for the photo shoot, and there's your, there's your reaction. Okay, yeah. I want to fit this in. Okay, so Tiffany on Facebook. We, mm -hmm. by the way, got so many questions for you. Tiffany on Facebook oh, nice. asks this question. Is there a woman that you suck up to or idolize like in Veep, or did you base that character on someone you know? Is there a woman you suck up or idolize like in Veep? Um, I would say no, but I'm sure that character came from a lot of pain somewhere. No. Um, I, <laughs> I think um, Gary was just... Uh, I th you know, I remember asking Dave, like, what, what, uh, the, the, the showrunner, what he wants, what Gary wants, and he just wanted Selena to love him. That's all he wanted. So he would just do anything to just love, to get her to love him. And so I kind of just kept using that. And also my base, just anxiety core. <laughs> I just drew from that. <laughs> well, other than Julia Louis Dreyfus, do you have a comedy idol? Yes, I do. Um, it is uh, Tim Conway from, uh, if, you, if you remember from the Carol Burnett show. Oh, um, Tim, Con please. Tim Conway. The best. Growing up, he was, um, I don't know if you remember that sketch where he was the dentist and he was working on Harvey Corman and he kept um, numbing his own, <laughs> his own body. I so he would actually numb his, he would numb his leg and his hand <laughs> and he just did it so effortlessly and it was just so beautiful and he just, he never winked at the audience. He never pushed the comedy. It was just effortless. And I just, I, I got to meet him once and I don't think I was able to speak. I just kind of went into a state I, I would be the same. I, when he shuffled around, oh, I'd like, oh, you know, yes. the, 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 oh, so he good. was the best. That's a good idol to have. And by the way, you're my comedy idol, even though I don't do comedy. Oh. If I did, you'd be the one. Yes. Tony, thank you for this. It's been so good to meet you. Uh, oh, your your so show nice is you. streaming this Friday, The Mysterious Benedict Society. It's on Disney+. Plus. Uh, I wish you all the luck in the world, and I hope we get to, to meet in person and hoist one uh, yes. someday. You as well. Bless you.